Hello, and welcome to Gaspar's History Podcast. This is Gaspar, and I'm continuing the Meat Hound series with Episode 8, Unbearable. Our series continues the adventures of Steel and the 423rd Bomb Squadron, which is part of the 306 Bomb Group in Thurley, England. Today's story takes place on February 4, 1943, after a day of rest and the aborted Groundhog Day mission on the 2nd. Today, the bomb group and the 423rd Squadron will be on a mission to Germany, where the cold weather once again wrecks havoc on the planes, but this time, the 306th completes the mission. The mission today gives us a chance to focus on one aircraft, the unbearable to better understand her lineage, the crew that flies her, and the punishment she will take. With that, let's jump into Unbearable. It was early in the morning, just after midnight, and the sky was lit up like the 4th of July. Steele followed the soldier in front of him out of the aircraft, and with his parachute open, he started to hurriedly drift towards the earth. Flak and tracers were all around, and everything seemed so chaotic. Then, there was a loud bang, and Steele felt pain in his left foot. He had been hit by flak, but he could not tell how bad it was. He only knew that it hurt. His ears were ringing from the blast, and the chaos is great. Steele was at the mercy of the winds, but as he fell, he could see a small French town beneath him, and he was headed for a burning building. So he pulled frantically, on his shroud lines, trying to steer clear a bit, and it worked. But he still crashed into the town's cathedral, bouncing off the roof, and as his parachute and shroud lines were now hung up on the spire, he was just dangling there, like some marionette, waiting for the master to guide him along. There were Germans in the town, and they were quite panicked, and as Steele's countrymen started to fall into the town, a battle between the U.S. soldiers and the German soldiers commenced. But Steele was stuck on the cathedral rooftop, hanging from the bell tower, over 30 feet off the ground, helpless. There were other soldiers now bouncing off the roof, and a friend of his was just hanging a few feet away. The German soldiers, in great confusion, were shooting at everything, and several U.S. soldiers had started to return fire, and the hard fighting had commenced. Steele was stuck, and he was wounded, so he decided to play possum. It was his best option, hoping not to attract attention. After a couple of hours, the two German soldiers in the bell tower above Steele realized he was there, and they thought he was alive. After a debate in German, they decided not to kill him, but rather they cut him down, and Steele fell hard to the ground, jarred by a tremendous fall and he was quickly captured. You are probably asking yourself, what is going on? Why is Steele hanging from the cathedral in a small French town? And why is there a battle in the town? You see, this Steele is John Steele of the 2nd Battalion, 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne, and the date is June 6th, 1944. And the town is St. Mary Glise, and the cathedral is Notre Dame. Not the Notre Dame, but just like all the other French towns in Normandy, their Notre Dame. There is no relation to steel in our story, but since I am writing this story on the 79th anniversary of the Normandy landings, and since I've been to St. Mary Glise, and since steel of St. Mary Glise is of the same name, I thought I would open this story to get us going. John Steele of the 82nd Airborne was immortalized by the great red buttons in the movie The Longest Day, which is made from Cornelius Ryan's book of the same name. If you've not read The Longest Day, then I, I would encourage you to do so. Even though Ryan covers a lot of material, he provides some good stories that you might find of particular interest like the fighting for St. Mary Glace, Pegasus Bridge, or Point de Hoc, of course. The crew sat in the briefing room, another 0530 mission briefing, waiting on Colonel Armstrong and Major Putnam, 
while betting on the mission target. Germany was now getting her fair share of votes, with St. Nazaire still the betting favorite. Colonel Armstrong, Major Putnam, and Major Schuller, the surgeon, came into the briefing room and greeted the crews and announced that Major Schuller had a few words to say. Major Schuller did not take long, but he wanted to make a point about frostbite. He and his surgeons were trying to figure out frostbite, and it really was a thing, and it really was an issue. He warned the crews it was going to be minus 40 degrees Celsius, so do not take off your gloves or your mask, and don't touch any metal with your bare hands. Verify your electric suits and gear are working, and do not try to fly without them. It really was less of a speech and more of a reminder, a pleading of sorts, that they were not immune to the science or Mother Nature, so please recognize and be cognizant of it. The crews listened with a little more interest than one of Schuller's VD speeches. Steele and the boys listened, and it made sense. But it was one of those things that until you experienced it, then it really didn't have true meaning. In other words, most of the chaps were going to learn the hard way, or witness a friend who does. After the good doctor's warning came the reveal. It would be Germany, and we will have a go at ham again. The secondary was the target as at Osnabrück, and the last resort was Emden. Can't you see? Those marshland yards at ham continued to be quite the prize. Steele and the crews knew the surprise was over and figured that the Luftwaffe would not be in such a disorganized state as it was in the first mission. Plus, the crews had to abort the February 2nd mission. So the reality was, at this stage of the war, it was a giant game of Red Rover, Red Rover, send the unbearable right over. The question was going to be how quickly the Germans were going to react and prepare for the next mission. As soon as the Luftwaffe moved that squadron into Brest, it had made for some hard flying, so it was not hard to believe that a squadron would not be moved into western Germany from either Italy or Russia. Osnabrück and Emden, two more cities we have never heard of, thinks Steele. What is the target? Why are we going there? Marshalling yards, railheads, airfields, and ports. The crews were told how the British RAF had been bombing Osnabrück since mid-1942 on a few of their nighttime raids. The last resort target of Emden was another port town like Wilhelmshaven, and not one of the men in that room that morning would ever think that Emden, this port town no one had ever heard of, would become one of the most raised cities in Europe. Sad, really, and the outcome on a people led astray by politicians, lest we forget. The tone in the mission briefing was changing now that Germany was the target. In prior briefings, the crews were warned that when bombing targets in France, there would be no indiscriminate bombing, and if the targets were not seen, then the bombs were not supposed to be dropped. However, now that we are over Germany, that is no longer true, and the crews will have much more liberty on targets of opportunity. Oh, and we will start to see the increased use of incendiary bombs. The incendiary bomb, Steele thought, well, that's a nasty device. Nasty indeed. The incendiary bomb, once ignited, burned at a very high temperature and would destroy most wood frame or shelled buildings. The true horror of these devices was unknown to Steele and his friends, but in the next couple of years, the true lethality of these devices would come to the surface. Once realized, you wanted to find solace in a bottle, you tried to justify it, you did your best to live with it, but every time the bombs dropped, you knew the potential fate you were delivering 20,000 feet below. The romance of war had quickly dissipated. Now it was a job, 
a job that no one wanted. Well, maybe not no one. But now these flyers had been engaged in combat and lived it, now that they've experienced the horrors of war and how their friends were not coming home, and to witness body parts bouncing off their aircraft at 20,000 feet, well, it'd be nice to go home, and it would be nice to have a glimmer of hope. You see, the bravado was starting to fade. The shine was starting to dull, and today they were going to do it all over again. As the crews headed for their aircraft, their morale was actually good, but not great. Steele was thinking it was good to fly. It provided him with a sort of liberty from his thoughts, because the flying, the aircraft, the crew, the mission became the focus. Some men were starting to crack, but all were trying to hide their emotions. One young man had approached Dr. Schuller and confessed that he had wished that the last bullet that missed him had not, because the waiting for the next bullet was a fate far worse and was excruciating to him. It was not what Steele was thinking, but he saw it and he heard it, and he tried to help where he could. And as the crews finished their rides to the plains, Dr. Schiller watched, inscribed in his diary, that, quote, these fellows are real men, and it's a shame that they have to be affected this way. Lieutenant Ralph Jones and Steele arrived at the unbearable and gave her a good external checkup, looking for breaks and imperfections. Since Captain Brady's death, Jones and Steele were getting comfortable with the unbearable, but Jones was a little more attached since he had flown with Brady. 41 24476 unbearable was also known as adorable, or at least she's referenced that way. She was starting to show signs of battle, the scars of war, you might say. Quite a bit of patching had been done, but some thought it made her look attractive. Unbearable was painted on her right side, below the side windows, back of the nose. Nothing fancy, just the name, Unbearable. We do not know who named her, we only know that she was named. She had arrived in Thurley in mid-October 1942. She was first flown in combat by our now-departed friend, Captain John Brady, on November 17, 1942, on a mission to St. Nazaire. And it was in this mission where Captain Brady, an unbearable, dropped out of formation with two other aircraft to protect Captain Williams and his aircraft that had been crippled by enemy fire. Isn't there some irony there? That Captain John Brady, who will fall out of formation, get attacked, only to have two other B-17s try to come and rescue him on that fateful day at the end of December. Let's take a moment and learn a little bit more about Unbearable, her history, and some of her brothers and sisters. This is where we see the fading screen and harp music as we go back in time, a prequel to our story. The Boeing workers in Seattle, half of which were women, were told of another pending production run of B-17 F bombers that would begin in early summer of 1942. Little would they know that in these 50 aircraft would be one of the most famous aircraft of all time. What these women and men did know was that the war was not going well, especially in the early summer of 1942. It was not headed in a good direction. They knew that this would be a total war effort and that what they were doing mattered. And with that, these ladies were kicking out some damn good aircraft. The materials and parts were delivered, the logistics were set, and the production started. With that, production block B-17F-10-B-O-41-24440 to 41-24489, 50 aircraft, started to roll off the assembly line with a new and improved modified tailwheel structure, which provided better geometry with the ground. The aircraft were then either sent to runways for delivery, or they were being hidden in Boeing City, just in case an attack 
on American soil occurred. Boeing City was a fake city developed to hide aircraft as they waited for shipment. Then came unbearable, number 37 of 50. Of course, the ladies did not know her name because she was not yet named. She was only a number to those that gently guided her through the production process. Nor would they know her fate, or that 81 years later we would be talking about her and those that assembled her, ran her wiring, stitched her canvas, and riveted her wings. Unbearable was a well-built aircraft, assembled by the best aircraft factory in the world, by the best assemblers in the world. Unbearable's brothers and sisters started to be delivered to heavy bomber squadrons in July of 1942, and with that, some of the most famous aircraft ever assembled had been made and delivered, but their fame would come later, nearly a year later. 41 24 440 Got Spurs would be Unbearable's eldest brother and would end up being a photo reconnaissance plane, and he would survive the war and was returned to the United States in 1944. 41 24 489 Terry and the Pirates, that was Unbearable's youngest sibling and an aircraft you are probably familiar with as we have heard the story how she was lost under Lieutenant McKesson on the mission to Romilly Susain, Deja Vu. The 50 aircraft off this production line started to be delivered to their squadrons the first week of July 1942. By the first week of February 1943, at the time of this story and mission, 17 of the 50 aircraft, 34%, have been lost in combat or mid-air collisions. One aircraft, San Antonio Rose, has a Medal of Honor recipient, posthumously. One has a Distinguished Service Cross, Sons of Fury. Remember Arizona Harris? 24444, the Red Gremlin, also known as Superman, has delivered the Supreme Commander, General Eisenhower, to Gibraltar. And then there was Unbearable's younger sister, 41 24 485, Memphis Bell. The Memphis Bell, one of the most iconic and famous aircraft in history, and one that today is used as the standard for model aircraft production. She came off the assembly line nine aircraft behind the Unbearable. In addition to Unbearable, the other sibling aircraft to her that you are familiar with are Excalibur. Montana Power, Lieutenant Reber's 24466, a no named F Beauty, the Wahoo, Lieutenant Brandon, and the Mystery of 24469, which we reviewed in the Old Friend mission, Four of a Kind, Floozy, Old Faithful, Flaming Mamie, also known as Joan of Arc, Eager Beaver, and Banshee Two. Quite the list and this cohort of Boeing F-model aircraft were really the tip of the spear, as I like to say, and they led the way in paving the way for the 8th Air Force bombing campaign in World War II. The next time you see the Memphis Bell, you have some more context around when and where she was built, who built her, and what some of the men were like that flew her and kept her repaired and armed. So far in our story, the Memphis Bell has been along for the rides in the Deja Vu mission and the Old Friend mission, and she will be with us today on the trip to Emden, Germany, as part of the 324th Heavy Bomb Squadron of the 91st Bomb Group. Now, back to the fading and the harp music, which brings us back to February 4th, 1943. Steele paused for a moment, looking at the unbearable. Then he climbed in and walked to the nose and said a few words to Second Lieutenant Orman Hamilton and Staff Sergeant William Hall. Then he found his way back to the cockpit and positioned himself into the right side co-pilot seat. This was Hamilton's first mission as navigator and Hall's first mission as bombardier. Hamilton was living near Brunswick, Georgia, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and he joined the Army as an air cadet two days later, 
December 9, 1941. Orman was 23 years old, single. He had three years of college under his belt. He'd been grounded with the flu since they had arrived in Thurley, but today he was going to fly his first combat mission, and he was happy to have some familiar faces around him. It was quite hazy this morning, but Orman was quite fond of his Navigator Ray-Bans and his soft-shell leather cap. In the nose of the unbearable with Orman was Staff Sergeant William Hull, a gunner by trade, but now he was trying his hand as a bombardier toggler. The bombardiers were officers, but togglers were allowed to be the enlisted men, so today it looks like the unbearable is leading the way in the advancement of togglers. The toggler would wait for the lead aircraft of the group to drop their bombs, then he would release his bombs at the same time. It is early in the war for togglers, but as the war goes on, more and more of them would be used. This also meant that the unbearable would not be carrying the Norden bomb site, because Hull was not going to measure or aim at anything. He was simply going to release his bombs at the same time as the lead bombardier. And the reality was, there was no guarantee that the unbearable was going to come home and the 8th Air Force would not want to lose a bomb site over enemy territory. In reviewing the photos of the Unbearable, it does not look like she was fitted with a 50 caliber Browning machine gun in her nose, so she only had the two side nose guns for defense. And Staff Sergeant Hull, he would be manning one of them, and Orman Hamilton would be manning the other. The crew were in the Unbearable. As we said, it was a miserably cold and dreary day, but they had a job to do, so they were anxious to get this mission going. The master and ignition switches were turned on. The engine batteries were tested. Lieutenant Jones signaled the ground crew to connect the external generator to help with engine start. The unbearable's hydraulic pumps got to pressure and kicked off. Steel set the parking brake and continued to call out the checklist. Steele checked the fuel gauges. The superchargers were in off position, and the props were set at low pitch angles. The cow flaps were opened and locked. The throttle opened just enough to run a 1,000 RPMs. Start number one engine. Steele held the starter switch down with his left hand, and he primed the engine pump with his right hand. Jones adjusted the mixture control. The mesh switch was held down, and steel continued to prime the number one engine. The unbearable's right cyclone engine sputtered, spun, and went into full rotation with that distinctive sound. Steele watched the oil pressure rise. Jones had an eye on the RPMs. Staff Sergeant Bamforth, the engineer, had an eye on both of them and the engine. The engine was good, and Jones said, let's start the second engine. The process was repeated, and number two was fired up. The vacuum gauge was checked, as was the flight indicator, the oil pressure, fuel pressure, and the RPMs. Steele and Jones ran the engines to 2,500 RPMs to check the superchargers, and they were all good. Jones backed off the engines now, and they waited their turn as Steele returned the checklist to its folder. Second Lieutenant Hamilton was eyeing his maps, and he had the route memorized. Sutton Bridge, that lovely coastal town of Cromer. I can only imagine it's nice. I've never been there. Then on northeast to Texel in the Netherlands. We should be there in under 40 minutes. Then a right bank, and on to Lingden, Germany. Then... Weidenbrook, and on to Ham. That is, if everything goes as planned. Okay, the secondary target was Osnabrück, or maybe Bremen. Breathe. Hamilton was smart and good at what he did. He was also a bit of a character, and he liked to be on stage, so the spotlight was not foreign to him. It was time, and Stardust won, that was the 306 call sign today, started to launch her aircraft. What a beauty was leading the group today, Wahoo 2. 
and it was being piloted by Captain Terry of the 369th Squadron. Captain Terry was a good leader and respected among the men. Following the Wahoo too was Little Audrey, and then a newcomer for us, Giesel, and then there was the fabulous, bodacious critter, the Grim Reaper, who was the older brother of Unbearable, followed by Unbearable's younger brother, Eager Beaver, then Steele's first plane, the DFC. Lieutenant Warner and 2nd Lieutenant Arnold Carlson were leading the 423rd Squadron today in their usual no-name deaf beauty, 42-5717. And then, just like clockwork, came Lieutenant George in the number 2 slot in 42-5171. Jones and Steele with Unbearable then tucked in to the number 3, and the second element came up, with Captain Smith and Lieutenant Johnson flying the older brother of Unbearable in 41 24460. And finally, bringing up the rear was Lieutenant Yuri in Scarlet. As the bomb group approached the first waypoint, Sutton Bridge, Captain Smith in 41 24460 asked the crew a question Is the life raft secured? Aye, aye, Captain. And that's not funny, came the response. Do you remember early in the series how the stories were told of life rafts coming loose and flying out of aircraft? Well, the 41-24460 had one such incident over Sutton Bridge, and that life raft wrapped itself around the horizontal stabilizer and brought the aircraft down in a crash landing. Today, There were no incidents at Sutton Bridge, and they headed for the coast and Cromer. The unbearable kept gaining altitude, and Jones was trying to stay tight in the formation, which on this hazy day added to everyone's nerves. Soon, they were at the zero hour, and Stardust One led the group out to sea. Steele had his usual view of Lieutenant Warner off of his bow and Lieutenant George off of his starboard but he could also see Wahoo 2 leading the way. Sergeant Stymax was monitoring his radio, and his good friend and fellow operator, Sergeant Roscovich, who was flying in the Scarlet today with Lieutenant Yuri and Hopkins, and they were tucked in formation just behind them. He wondered if the mad Russian, that was Roscovich's nickname, had carried the fake bomb with him today, as he liked to do. Stymax loved to send Roscovich a message, but radio silence was the rule, and Stymax was not going to break it. Well, at least today. Or would he? There were a lot of friends in the 423rd triad of aircraft, piloted by Warner, George, and Jones. This triad was close, and they were getting used to flying with each other. As the unbearable made her way over the channel for her short 37-minute flight to the next waypoint at Texel, Sergeant Walter Piotrowski from New Hampshire made his way into the ball turret gun position, without his parachute, of course, because it did not fit, and he was then locked into position. Walter, with his gloves on and electric suit keeping him semi-warm, he wrapped his hands around his browning grips and with a rat-a-tat-tat-tat-tat sent a few 50 caliber rounds headed for the channel. James Smoot, from his tail gun position, not to be outdone, followed course. Sergeant Hull was in the nose, so he tested the nose guns. Sergeant Bamforth, from his engineer position, was keeping tabs on everyone. Then he, too, tested his guns, and the unbearable was fully functional so far, and the report came back to the pilots. So far is the key, as the group passed muster for now, but the frigid air would chip away at the mechanicals by the time that combat started. Jones made the call over the intercom. Battle stations, man your battle stations, but they already knew. They could see the coastline and the Dutch barrier islands, so they knew they needed to be on high alert. The unbearable, like the rest of the group, was carrying 10 500-pound general-purpose bombs. And, suddenly, similar to the first trip to Germany, another fleet appeared of German naval vessels, and they were leaving Texel, bearing 200 degrees. 
Hall, Jones, and Steele all commented, Do you see that? There must be 30 ships in the fleet. Get it logged for the mission reports, Jones ordered. Over in the DFC, an aircraft still partial to Steele, since it was the first aircraft he flew. Lieutenants Gologly and Fryer noted the fleet was in a V formation, with the point leading the column and the larger ships sitting in the center of the V for protection. It was about this time that the eager beaver, with Lieutenants Reber and Lally, saw a plane out of the 91st Bomb Group, 322nd Bomb Squadron, which was following the 306th, break out of formation and make an attack on the fleet. When the crew status reports came into Lieutenant William Beasley in the Luftwaffe Waterloo, the ball turret gunner reported that the ball turret and the guns were frozen, not to mention the sergeant in the ball turret. Lieutenant Beasley thought it over and he knew breaking from the squadron would be dangerous as lone birds were easy targets. But he felt like he would have more protection trying to get home than having to fight his way through Germany and then get home. And then there was the fleet. It was an opportunity too great to pass up. I mean, after all, in the Pacific, the Georgia Peach, which was Unbearable's older sister, she had two subs and seven ships destroyed to her credit. And with that, the eager beaver and the rest of the 306 bomb group watched Lieutenant William Beasley and his crew on the Luftwaffe Waterloo break out of formation and head for the fleet. When the Luftwaffe Waterloo broke ranks, her crew was on full alert in combat positions while the flak and anti-aircraft fire from their ships started to sail through the sky like some kind of Disney magical light parade. Get those bomb pins pulled. Roger that. Bomb bay doors open. Roger. We don't have much time and we don't want to be looking for any additional trouble. There was not enough time for precision. The bomb sight stabilizer was level. Airspeed check. Altitude check. The targets are moving, sir. Get those bombs released best you can and give them a scare and let's get out of here. And with that, the 10 500-pound bombs were gone. Bombs away, sir. Lieutenant Beasley had the bearing for home, and as the flak and tracers were coming up to meet them, the 10 500-pound bombs fell through the sky, and the Nazi Navy could see them falling. The ships went into evasive action, as a direct hit from one of these bombs would be catastrophic. Let's also recognize the fact that if there were any submarines close by, when those bombs exploded, they would be in even more trouble. The Luftwaffe Waterloo watched the best she could on that hazy day with all the clouds, and one by one, the bombs exploded through the fleet without further incident. The Luftwaffe Waterloo had put the Nazi Navy on notice that they were there, and now they were hightailing at home. The unbearable's outside temperature gauge read minus 40 degrees Celsius, its maximum reading so the crew was wondering what the real temperature was. The bomb group then made their waypoint and banked right for their run into Germany. They were headed for Ham, but the cloud cover was too great, so decisions were quickly made for secondary or last resort targets. But unlike France, all of Germany was a target, so if a crew saw a target of opportunity, then they were allowed to release their lethal payloads. There is a correlation here between the bombing of Germany and General Sherman's march to the sea during the American Civil War. If one can make war so horrible on the civilian population, then their support for their government and their leaders fades. And so maybe that is a story for another day. The flak was getting heavy, and the truth was each of the aircraft were being hit, but so far there had been no serious damage. And unlike the missions to France, these German gunners had not quite found their range, at least with the 306 bomb group, and we are thankful for that. But as we will see, the other bomb groups, they were not so lucky. At 11.40 a.m., the bomb group changed course to 300 degrees, and they were 20 minutes out from the bomb run. The target was going to be the last resort at Emden. 
In the unbearable, Leon Bamforth from his engineer top turret gun called it out. Fighters, fighters, three o'clock. The flak was starting to pick up and Jones was moving the plane around, which always makes Lieutenants George and Mallon nervous. And on a hazy day like this, who could blame them? The Luftwaffe was starting to show up in force. Each of the unbearable's gunners started to call out fighters, but they were staying a little out of range. James Smooth then called it out from his tail gun position. Captain, B-17 going down in group behind us. Spinning. I think it was flak. No shoot, sir. Roger that. Jones responded as the black puffs of smoke started to intensify around the unbearable. The 306th bomb group was now within 15 minutes of the bomb run, and the enemy fighters started to get aggressive, and it looks like today they were going to defend the fatherland. One of those Messerschmitt ME-109 Fokers stood up and accepted the challenge, and it made a 3 o'clock starboard dive attack on the little Audrey. The Messerschmitt pressed the attack home. Steel and Bamforth had a great view, but the attack was a little too far away for Bamforth to provide support. Jones was wondering, what is taking so long? Blimey weather. The bomb group felt like they were suspended in time, and they were moving like sloths in quicksand. And the triad of Warner, George, and Jones were thinking to themselves, what is going on? Let's get on with this. Let's get out of here. Little Audrey erupted a defense, and the Browning machine guns rattled. Tech Sergeant Wiley was in the top turret gun and in perfect position. Lieutenant Colantoni could see the attack, which was distracting him from the bombardier duties. Co-pilot Little John only knew Wiley was firing at something. Lieutenant Colantoni was having a bad mission as Wiley was throwing up a defense. He was on his reserve oxygen because his main line was broken, and now both of the nose guns stopped working due to belt feeding issues. The ME-109 F sent a cannon shell and 8mm bullets towards the little Audrey, but Tech Sergeant and Engineer Wiley was not having any of it, and at 500 yards the ME-109 started to smoke and Wiley put another burst into her and watched as the enemy aircraft leveled off, then immediately flipped into a nosedive for 21,000 feet, with Lieutenant Colantoni watching her crash into the ocean, and the beautiful azure blue ME-109 was no more. Steele was mumbling to himself, I guess we woke the Luftwaffe up. Pilot to Tigler, status? Hull replied, bomb bay doors open and all eyes were on Wahoo 2 and the toddlers were going to release the bomb loads when Frank Yalsey in Wahoo 2 drops theirs. Pilot to bombardier, rack selector switches. Roger, we are ready, sir. Then there was a staring at the Wahoo 2. Steele was watching the gauges. Jones was trying to hold position and the rest of the crew were manning guns. Stymax from his radio position was at his gun challenging any of those yellow-nosed bastards to make a run at them. And then it happened. I think this is a good spot to break this mission into two parts due to the length of the mission. The next episode will take the unbearable and steel through their bomb run, the pursuit back out of Germany, and conclude with an emergency landing at a different airfield. Until we meet again, just think of the things you may find while you are looking for something else. Gaspar, out. <laughs>